Hi, everybody. I'm Anna Harvey, president of the Social Science Research Council, and I'm so pleased to welcome you all here today to the Council's third centennial lecture. The centennial lectures celebrate the founding of the Social Science Research Council 100 years ago and the achievements of the social and behavioral sciences over the last 100 years. Each centennial lecture is given by a faculty member from one of the institutions in the Council's College and University Fund for the Social Sciences and is focused on one of 10 policy issues that represent the last 100 years of the Council's work. In January, we focused on immigration, the subject of the Council's very first research initiative in the 1920s. In February, we focused on social insurance, which was a critically important research area for the Council in the 1930s. This month, we're looking at research on racial discrimination, which was a focus of the Council's work in the 1940s. In 1939, the Carnegie Corporation asked the Social Science Research Council to support Gunnar Myrtle's work on uh, racial discrimination in the United States. And the Council helped Myrtle build a staff of researchers that included former SSRC fellow Ralph Bunch. And their project resulted in the 1944 book, An American Dilemma, which was cited by the United States Supreme Court in its 1954 school desegregation case, Brown v. Board of Education. Gunnar Myrtle was later awarded the Nobel Prize in Economics, and Ralph Bunch was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. And in the decades since their work, we have developed new tools to evaluate the effectiveness of interventions that are designed to reduce racial discrimination. We now know, for example, that federal legislation and executive orders penalizing racial discrimination in employment, access to public accommodations and voting, and requiring companies to take affirmative steps to increase their hiring of underrepresented groups all had substantial effects on reducing discriminatory behaviors. And today we are very fortunate to have with us one of the country's leading researchers on racial discrimination, Conrad Miller from the University of California, Berkeley. Conrad is gonna share with us his pathbreaking work on discrimination and employment. And I'm so happy to welcome him here today. Feel free as Conrad is talking to post questions in the Q&A and I will field them to him after he winds up and we'll have about 15 minutes for Q&A after Conrad is done. So Conrad, uh, thanks for being with us today. The floor is yours. Thank you, Anna. Thanks for that great introduction. And it's really an honor to be involved in this uh, lecture series with a lot of great, great speakers. So let me begin by sharing my slides here. Okay. All right. So today I'm gonna to discuss some recent research on racial inequality and discrimination in the labor market. And the theme I'm gonna focus on is a question. And that question is why do firms vary so much in the racial composition of their employees? A follow-up question will be, you know, can the answer to that tell us anything about how racial inequality is produced? So using the best available data, we know that the black and white workers are as segregated across workplaces as they were in 1970. To get a sense for the magnitude here, in a national sample from 2000, where about 7% of workers in the sample uh, were black, among black workers, 24% of their coworkers were black. So even though 4% of this sample was black among black workers, 24% of their coworkers were black, which is a reflection of, of widespread workplace segregation. And it turns out only some of this segregation can be explained by things like the types of work people are engaged in or where those jobs are located. This degree of segregation is, is difficult to rationalize with a standard economic model of labor demand. In these kind of models, the demographic composition of, of uh, workforces across firms is only going to vary across firms you know, either by chance or 
because of uh, the extent to which the type of work varies across these workplaces. We can build on those kind of frameworks and try and accommodate or explain the variation we see in the world. But typically the way we think through that is we think it reflects some fundamental differences across firms, some form of persistent heterogeneity. So for example, we might add discriminatory tastes as in a Becker model so that some firms prefer to hire from particular groups holding productivity and wages fixed. But even with those kind of adjustments, standard economic models give the impression that the demographic composition of any firm is in some ways inevitable given the type of work it requires. Today, I'm gonna to discuss some recent evidence that in fact, the racial composition of firms' employees is, is surprisingly malleable. So in particular, the composition of, of these firms changes in systematic ways over time. And we'll see it can also be shaped by even temporary policies. So my discussion is going to focus on two research articles I've worked on, but I'll, I'll allude to, to other work as well. Uh, those two papers are the persistent effect of, of temporary affirmative action and the dynamic effects of co-racial hiring, which is co-authored with, with Ian Schmutty. Through this discussion, we'll begin to examine what this malleability means for our original question, why do firms vary in whom they hire? I'm gonna start by setting some important context for racial inequality in the labor market in the United States. And the general message here is, is, is not a positive one. So overall, there's been quite limited progress since 1960 in black, white labor market inequality. Let's take earnings to begin with. Here I'm citing work by Pat Bayer and Kerwin Charles. In 1960, the, the median white working age man earned about twice as much per year as his black counterpart. In 2014, this gap was about the same. For women, the current gap is similar to what it was in 1980. Now, these statistics are, are not just about wages. They reflect both differences in wages as well as employment rates. And the differences in employment rates are quite important to emphasize here. Since 1960, the ratio of black to white unemployment rates has been roughly a constant at, at two, with black unemployment rates being twice as high. And this comes from both the fact that black workers separate from their jobs at higher rates. They also find jobs at lower rates when they're unemployed. Now, despite this, this stagnation in the aggregate, I'm gonna show you some evidence of progress at the firm level in these two papers. We'll talk about at the very end how these kind of two trends can be reconciled. So the first paper I'm gonna talk about is called The Persistent Effect of Temporary Affirmative Action. And this is a paper where I'm looking at what happens at US firms when they're subject to affirmative action interventions and those interventions are temporary. So in particular, this paper studies US federal affirmative action regulation. This is regulation that applies to firms holding significant government contracts. So by Department of Labor estimates, these kind of firms account for about a quarter of the US workforce. And what this regulation does is it mandates that covered employer, employers make efforts to employ a diverse workforce. I'll say a little bit more about that uh, in a couple slides. Now, in this paper, I studied the effect on Black employment at the firm in particular, which is an original target of the regulation. And I'm interested in, in three research questions in this project. So first is, does this regulation work as intended and indeed increase the black share of employees at regulated establishments. And the second question, which is really the, the key here is, does a temporary affirmative action regulation at an establishment have a persistent effect on this outcome? Third, if so, you know, what mechanisms could generate this persistence? Now, before I get into to what I find here, let me tell you a little bit about this last question, what motivates it? So why might we think a temporary affirmative action could potentially have persistent effects? If you think through a really a standard economic model of 
uh, how firms might respond to a regulation like this. I think that that standard model would suggest that a temporary intervention, a temporary affirmative action regulation would have no long-term effect. So one way to think about that is, well, prior to this regulation, you know, firms are optimizing in some sense, they're hiring the best available job candidates for them. And what you might expect is that a regulation like this is, is forcing firms to lower their hiring um, standards to comply with this regulation for affected groups. Okay, if that's what firms are doing, then if I take away that affirmative action regulation so that firms are no longer subject to that rule, what we'd probably expect is that firms are going to re-optimize and they're going to revert back to whatever they were doing pre-regulation. Maybe they retain people that they hired during that period, but moving forward, we might expect them to, to do the same kinds of, um, to make the same kind of personnel choices they were making pre-regulation. On the other hand, it's possible that an affirmative action regulation, a temporary one, could have an, a, pers a persistent effect on personnel practices. So in particular, what we might think is, it's not just that firms are gonna change their hiring standards, but they might actually um, uh, change the way they go about making recruiting and screening decisions, for example. So we might think they make improvements in how they find candidates from these underrepresented groups. So one example of this could be, you know, prior to an affirmative action regulation, a firm might recruit from a certain set of high schools. Uh, it might recruit from a certain set of high schools where most students coming from those schools are, are white. They may not branch outside of those high schools if or, or you know, community colleges, whatever you want. Um, without any sort of regulation because they're getting the candidates they need from those sets of schools, branching outside of that set of schools might be costly. What an affirmative action policy might do though, is it might now incentivize firms to branch out and figure out how are they going to recruit and screen from a broader set of schools. And it's possible if, if, if figuring that out involves some kind of irreversible costs here. So I, I figure out and learn how to recruit and screen from this broader set of schools, even in the absence of regulation, I might continue uh, to use those sources of candidates. Now, there are other examples of, of investments that firms that in firms might make that have this kind of flavor. So they might employ or train personnel specialists, they might formalize their HR practices, they might harness their referral networks in a different way to target underrepresented groups, and more broadly, they might develop relationships with employment intermediary, intermediaries, including other employment agencies or schools uh, to find candidates. Finally, there might just be some aspects of, of kind of learning by doing or experimentation where firms figure out um, how to hire from groups they weren't hiring from previously. And for all of these examples, if these investments have some, some costs, firms may continue to use uh, those investments even post regulation. Okay, so that's that's what might happen here. Let's talk about what actually does happen. So first, a little bit more background on affirmative action regulation. Okay, so I'm studying here uh, Executive Order 11246, which was introduced by President Lyndon Johnson in 1965. What this regulation does is it mandates that firms with federal contracts, uh, in particular those with at least 50 or more employees or uh, and at least $50,000 or more in federal contracts, do the following for each of their establishments. So first, they must identify and make a good faith effort to correct underutilization of minority workers at, uh, at the establishment, where this benchmark is defined as, as quote, the, the availability of minorities having the requisite skills in an area in which the contractor can reasonably recruit. Second, these firms must maintain an affirmative action plan uh, for each establishment. And what that plan includes is goals for how a firm's gonna go about reaching those benchmarks, uh, uh, goals and plans for how they're gonna go about reaching those benchmarks. Um, it's gonna include timetables, strategies, et cetera. Third, these, form, these, these firms need to maintain data on personnel flows. So people that are, they're, are hired, um, people that are, are separating disaggregated minority by minority group, which is data they might not have included or collected in the first place. 
broadly speaking, I, the way you should think about this kind of regulation is, is, is what it's doing is it's pressuring contractor firms to make an effort to employ minorities uh, at rates at least proportional to their shares of the local and qualified workforce, where importantly, that, that benchmark is not set explicitly by the regulation, right? So what is local and qualified is left up to interpretation to some degree, um, but there's this kind of general pressure on firms to do something in principle. Another kind of background piece of context that's important to keep in mind here is how is this regulation actually enforced? And it's important to note that the degree of enforcement has probably varied quite a bit over time. The regulation is enforced now by what's known as the Office of Federal Contract Compliance Programs, or OFCCP. OFCCP's main enforcement mechanism is what are known as compliance reviews, which are essentially audits. So each year, the OFCCP is going to review a small percentage of contractor establishments. And in those reviews, they're going to determine whether the affirmative action plans those establishments have on file are sufficient and whether they're actually making um, sufficient uh, effort to implement those plans. These reviews are typically retrospective. They're focusing on what firms have done in the last year. And in their evaluation, the OFCCP is going to use the data on personnel flows that firms are collecting, as well as data that I'll, I'll be using in this study, EO1 form data, which I'll discuss uh, in the next slide. Now, what happens if firms are found in noncompliance? Well, the ultimate punishment for noncompliance is that a company can be debarred from federal contracting, either for a short period or permanently. In practice, this happens uh, very, very rarely, and milder sanctions are much more common, including you know, financial settlements uh, for back pay. Even more common would be uh, letters of a commitment or conciliation agreements where firms agree to, to make a better effort next time. Now, an important thing to keep in mind for this study is that if an establishment is not a contractor, there's no sense in which they're under the jurisdiction of the OSCCP. And in general, their minority share, the minority share of, an, of a firm's employees is not going to determine their eligibility for federal contract, for federal contracts. They're only subject to that regulation once they become uh, contractors. So there's not really a sense in which this regulation incentivizes firms to engage in any kind of anticipatory behavior. Okay, so let me tell you about the data we use in this paper. So I'm using what's known as EEO1 form data which are collected by the US Equal Employment Opportunity Commission as part of the Civil Rights Act of 64. We're gonna use data covering the years 1978 to 2004. These reports include counts of the racial and gender composition of employees by occupation for uh, establishments in the data. The data cover all firms with 100 or more employees or 50 plus for federal contractors. And the data include a separate report for each establishment with 50 or more employees and a report for each firm's headquarters. Now, one thing that's useful for the purposes of this study is that the data also include an indicator for contractor status. And over the period of, of this study, the OFCCP was actually using these same data to identify contractors. So I'm gonna use these data to try and understand what effect does being a contractor and hence being subject to federal affirmative action regulation have on the racial composition of employees at these firms? Now, the way I'm going to answer this question is I'm going to use uh, what's called an event study research design. Okay, The idea here is to exploit variation in the timing of regulation and deregulation across work establishments. Now, what do I mean by, by, by deregulation here? Well, the government's buying all types of goods and services. For many of those product categories, the set of companies the government's actually doing business with is, is constantly changing. Okay, so there, there are many companies that are perennial federal contractors. Think of a, a Boeing or a Raytheon. These kind of firms are always subject to affirmative action regulation. They're not going to be the focus of this study. Instead, I'm going to focus on the subset of firms that move in and out of federal contracting, right? Maybe I have a contract for a few years and then I stop working with the government. 
So in that sense, once I stop engaging in, in federal contract work, I'm deregulated. I'm no longer subject to this affirmative action regulation. It's exactly this kind of turnover in contracting that's going to provide useful variation in which and when establishments are subject to uh, this regulation. For the main analysis that I'm going to show you here, I'm going to restrict the data, the EO1 data, to establishments that are either never contractors, they're going to serve as a useful control group. So these are firms that are never subject to federal, to federal affirmative action regulation. The second set of firms I'm going to include are eventual contractors that satisfy two conditions. So first, these are establishments that I don't see showing up in the data as a contractor. So there's some period um, where they're in the data, but not a contractor. I'm going to make this data, I'm going to make this um, restriction so that I can evaluate pre-trends. I can see how these firms compare to non-contractor establishments before they become regulated. The second restriction I'm going to make is I'm going to look at uh, establishments where I last observed them in the data as a non-contractor. So in other words, I'm looking at, at establishments that eventually lose and never regain their contractor status in the data. And this is actually a pretty common thing. Once you restrict to firms that don't show up in the data as contractors, about 60% of them are eventually going to lose their contractor status. So there's quite a bit of churn here, and that, that churn uh, is going to be quite useful. Now, for these event studies, there are two events I'm interested in. There's the regulation event, and by that I mean there's the event of a firm first becoming a contractor and hence first becoming subject to this regulation. And then there's a deregulation event, which is that, that, that period when the firm transitions to being a non-contractor and never regains contractor status. So from that point on, they are no longer subject to this regulation. Uh, I have a few descriptive statistics here for these two sets of, of firms. So um, the first column has all of the establishments in, in the EO1 data that I'm looking at. And then I'm uh, breaking it out by these non-contractor establishments. These are establishments that I see never becoming contractors. And these temporary contractors are the ones that I see eventually becoming contractors and then losing that contractor status. The main thing I want to highlight here is these non-contractors, the second column is essentially going to be a control group for that third column. These two sets of establishments actually look quite similar on a number of dimensions. In this table, I've included size and industry, uh, but they also look similar in terms of their racial composition before these temporary contractors uh, become contractors. Now, next, let me show you what this comparison looks like in this event study. So this graph is illustrating is how the racial composition of firms that become contractors, temporary contractors, evolves compared to firms that are never contractors. So event time here is on the horizontal axis. This is years since firms first become contractors. On the vertical axis, I have the establishment's black share uh, of employees in percentage points. Okay. So this green line is telling us about how the black share of employees is evolving at these contractor uh, establishments once they become contractors. I've normalized the coefficient here to zero for the year prior uh, to the regulation event. So what this is showing you here is that prior to these temporary contractors becoming contractors, they're on very similar trends to non-contractors. There's really no kind of differential um, change in their establishment black share over time. But once these firms become contractors, you see a clear break in trend here, where now the black share of these firms, employ of these establishments employees is increasing year over year. Okay. So one way of kind of summarizing the magnitude of this relationship is about five years after a firm uh, first becomes a contractor, the black share of their employees increases by about 0.8 percentage points, so nearly a one percentage point. Now that might seem pretty small, but because you know the black share of the entire workforce is not that large, this is actually a, a meaningful magnitude. So one way of putting that in perspective is that if the black share of the entire workforce in the U.S. increased by 0.8 to 1.3 percentage points, 
that would actually eliminate black white differences uh, in jobless rates over my period of study. Okay, so it's it's, it's actually a pretty big, um, pretty big magnitude viewed through that lens. So that's when firms first become uh, contractors. What happens when these firms stop working with the government and now are deregulated? Strikingly, what we find is that uh, what I find is that the black share of employees continues to increase at establishments even following their deregulation. So this persistent, uh, this temporary regulation is having a persistent effect on personnel outcomes. Now, the way to see this in, in this figure is again, we've got event time on the horizontal axis, where now we're looking over a longer time frame. On the vertical axis, again, we have the black share. Uh, of employees, or the increase in the black share of employees at these establishments. Uh, and here we're breaking out firms by how many years uh, between basically their first contract and their last contract. Okay. So if I look at the year marked in you know, four to six years, these are firms that uh, for some four to six year period, there's some four to six year period between their regulation event and their deregulation event. When the line is solid, this is the period where uh, they are, are subject to some affirmative action regulation during this period. What you see is that following uh, these firms transition to non-contractors, and so now they're no longer subject to this affirmative action regulation, the black share of employees actually continues to increase at roughly the same rate. And you can see that for all of these different categories of firms. Okay, so for firms that are contractors for seven to nine years, even just one year, you still see some effect there. So you see striking, striking persistence uh, in the sense that these firms are continuing to hire more black workers, even when they're no longer subject to these regulations. So what's what's going on uh, in this uh, in that figure? Well, for one, uh, there's a lot more kind of work in the in the in the article showing that this is not about anticipatory behavior. So this is not about firms anticipating that they're going to become contractors in the future. It's also unlikely to reflect human capital investments by workers. So one mechanism that the economics literature has typically focused on for how a temporary uh, intervention could have a persistent effect is by somehow um, changing employer beliefs about some group of workers, and those changes in beliefs in turn incentivizing workers to invest more in their own human capital. That kind of mechanism is unlikely to be relevant here because just given the research design, uh, everything's happening at the employer level. So the actions of one employer is probably going to have very little effect on the incentives faced by workers who are presumably searching in a much broader labor market. Instead, uh, I show evidence in the paper that it's much more likely that this reflects persistent changes in personnel, uh, personnel practices at these firms. So these contractor firms generally have more kind of formalized HR practices. They work with more uh, employment intermediaries. And what is potentially happening here is that these firms continue to do that uh, even when they're no longer subject to these regulations. Now, I think importantly, even if we can't pinpoint the mechanism exactly, what this finding suggests is that we're in a world where there are multiple equilibria for the composition of a, of a given firm's employees. The composition here is not kind of inevitable because we can see a temporary intervention can have a persistent and permanent effect on these firms' uh, trajectories. And so that kind of really broadens the scope for uh, thinking about why racial composition varies so much across firms. It doesn't necessarily reflect some fundamental difference across firms and what kinds of work they need. Uh, it's possible that any given firm could have very different compositions and operate um, in the same way. Okay, now uh, that's this paper. I wanna say there's, there's a few other papers that highlight, I think, similar, um, similar patterns. Okay, so the, the, the first that I know of is this paper by Warren Watley in, in 1990, where he shows that in a sample of Cincinnati manufacturing plants during World War I, at these plants, once they hire Black employees, the, the, the firms that hire Black employees in, in one period 
are more likely to do so in the future as well, which suggests perhaps the same kind of uh, state dependence where you know a shock to your composition at one period affects subsequent outcomes. Another example of this is a paper by Amalia Miller and Siegel. They're looking at court-ordered hiring quotas that were imposed on police departments across the country, primarily during the 1970s. It's been shown that these quotas increase black employment at these police departments. What Miller and Siegel show is that these gains do not erode when these quotas are lifted. Okay, kind of similar to what we find here, although here it's it's more more than just a lack of erosion, actually, you see continued gains over time. Uh, another paper in this vein uh, is uh, Saez, Schofer, and, and Syme. What they show is that a tax subsidy for youth employment successfully increases youth employment at affected firms. This is in, in Sweden. And what's interesting is that even after this subsidy is phased out, affected firms continue to hire more young employees. Okay, so somehow this tax subsidy shocked these firms to engage in different hiring practices, uh, even when that subsidy is phased out. Uh, and finally, uh, in uh, work um, in Saudi Arabia, Jen Peck uh, and Mehmet Fleck, um, and I find evidence that firms in Saudi Arabia exhibit state dependence in hiring, in hiring women in that context. Okay. I'm going to shift gears here uh, to the second paper, again on this same theme, but looking in a different context here. So the paper I'm going to talk about is the dynamic effects of, of co-racial hiring. And this paper looks at racial inequality in Brazil, which is a obviously a very different context, but it's important to keep in mind here that Brazil is a country of well-documented racial disparities here between white and non-white Brazilians. So wage gaps on the order of 30%, unemployment gaps, uh, similar magnitude. This is also a context where it's been shown that workplace segregation has direct implications for earnings inequality. So in particular, um, what Gerard and, and co-authors show is that non-white Brazilians work at lower paying firms. And the, that fact explains about 20% of wage variation of wage differences between white and non-white Brazilians in that context. Now, what do we what do we look at in the Brazilian context? Where well, everything we're uh, kind of focused on here is motivated by this what we think of as a, a new stylized fact, and that's that in these Brazilian firms, the non-white share of firms hires is increasing in the cumulative hires to date at those firms. This figure that I've shown here illustrates this pattern. So what we've done here is we've got employer-employee data from Brazil, which I'll talk about in a few slides. We've looked at a, a balanced panel of Brazilian firms. And what we're doing is we're plotting the relationship between cumulative hires at these firms and the non-white share of their, of their hires. Okay, here we're splitting out firms into buckets based on how many hires we observe them making. So let me walk you through as an example what, what's illustrated in this figure. If I look at the solid orange line here, these firms are firms that we see making at least 500 hires in the data. At these firms, nearly 40% of first hires at these firms are non-white. In this context, you can think of roughly half of the working age population is, is white versus non-white. So for first hires, about 40% of first hires are, are, are white. But if, when we look over the firm's life cycle, we look at the 500th hire of these firms, say, about 46% of the 500th hires at these firms are non-white. Okay, so we have this systematic relationship between cumulative hires and the non-white share of hires at these firms. Similar patterns for firms that ultimately make fewer hires. We show in the, in the paper that this, this pattern is not driven by job characteristics like occupation. Instead, it reflects something very different about labor demand at these firms early versus late in a firm's life cycle, okay? So again, this is a kind of an interesting example of the idea that a given firm's demographic composition is not this inevitable thing. It's something that evolves over time. 
And we think it has something to do with how labor demand is changing over the firm's life cycle. And in particular, we think it has uh, two ingredients kind of driving that stylized fact that I just showed you. The first is what we call co-racial hiring. And all we mean by this is some set of hiring practices that favor whatever group is already well represented at the firm. So here we have in mind mechanisms like referral hiring, given segregation in social networks, or the documented tendency for managers to hire employees from their own racial group. Okay, so just some mechanism that is going to end up favoring whatever group is already well represented at the firm. The second ingredient is racial disparities in entrepreneurship, which here we're thinking of as determining the initial social conditions for a firm. In Brazil, there are uh, large racial disparities in entrepreneurship. So white Brazilians are about twice as likely to report themselves as entrepreneurs in survey data. We argue that these two stylized facts can match, uh, these two um, ingredients can match the stylized fact I just showed you. In particular, the idea is, okay, if most founders are white here, with co-racial hiring, early hires are going to be disproportionately white because they're going to be disproportionately drawn from the founder's racial group. But there are reasons to think this effect is going to, this effect of co-racial hiring is going to fade out over time as outgroup workers are eventually hired and then, and then influence subsequent uh, hiring decisions. Okay, so let me give you an example of why that might happen. Let's think through a more concrete example of referral hiring. So suppose that when a firm is, is hiring, there's some probability they're gonna hire someone that's a referral from some incum incumbent employee at the firm. Otherwise, the firm's gonna hire someone from the external market. And let's think about a firm that has uh, just one employee here uh, represented here. You can think of this person as, as the founder. We're further going to assume that referral networks are, are perfectly segregated. So white incumbents refer white candidates, non-white incumbents refer non-white candidates. What kind of, uh, let's play out what that kind of model um, is going to, to lead to. So let's consider the first hire that a firm with a white founder makes. This hire is either drawn from the referral pool depicted to the left here or uh, under the founder or from the external market here under this job board uh, image. So if the hire is drawn from the referral pool, then by assumption that referral is necessarily going to be going to be white given segregation of referral networks. Then for the next vacancy, the referral pool is going to remain all white. So as long as the firm continues to hire just re referral, it's going to remain all white. Okay, so this is an extreme version of co-racial hiring. But if we return to that first hire, it's also possible that that initial hire is drawn from the external market. And it's also possible that that external market candidate is non-white. Okay, so in that case, now if we look at the next vacancy that the firm hires for, uh, the racial composition of the referral pool is now gonna look a lot more like whatever the composition of the external market is. And so more generally, as firms hire more and more people, the racial composition of the firm's employees is gonna tend to shift to the composition of the, ex, of, the ex, uh, of the external market. So we're gonna test this idea in Brazilian data. Brief overview on the data we're using. These are what are known as the, the rice data in Brazil. So these are very rich employer-employee data covering the formal sector. And we're gonna be focusing on data from the years 2003 to 2017. It's gonna include information on the start and end dates for job spells, which is gonna be important for ordering uh, the sequence of hires that firms make. It also includes detailed information on occupation. It excludes the informal sector, which is, is important in Brazil, but uh, is, is not covered in these data. And we're gonna focus on new hires at new entrant firms in these data. Okay, and we're gonna focus on private sector uh, indeterminate length contracts. Now, our main test for this co-racial hiring idea is we're gonna compare firms with white and non-white founders. Because in this framework, we expect those two sets of firms to end up on very different trajectories, right? The founder race is setting the initial social conditions of the firm. So we expect that 
initially those firms are going to look quite different in terms of the racial composition of their sub, of their of their initial hires. But as cumulative as cumulative hires increases, the composition of these hires at firms and with white and non-white founders should converge. We're going to proxy for the race of the founder in the data using either the race of the top paid manager when the firm first uh, shows up in the data, or we can use the composition of ownership and get similar findings. Here's what we find uh, with this kind of exercise. So I've left out the details on the model we've estimated, but you should think of us as comparing similar firms with white and non-white founders. So same labor market, hiring the same types of jobs. Uh, and what we're plotting here is how the racial composition of these firms' hires evolves with cumulative hires. The horizontal, the vertical axis here is, is in log points here. So let me talk through how to read that. If I look at this kind of initial light red line here, these are firms that we observe making 50 to 249 hires with white founders. What this line is telling us is that the probability that their hire is non-white increases by nearly 10 log points going from their first hire to their 50th hire. So nearly 10% increase um, in the probability that that hire is non-white. And more broadly, what you see here is that that aggregate pattern I showed you at the beginning masks in very important uh, differences between firms with white and non-white founders. So initially, firms with white founders are, are about you know, 30, 20 to 30% less likely to hire workers, uh, non-white workers, compared to similar firms with non-white founders. But as you see, as cumulative hires increases, the differences between these two firms dissipates quite a bit. So that once we get to about 400 hires, these differences seem to plateau, and we move from a gap of about 30 log points to a gap of closer to four to five log points. So pretty substantial convergence between these two sets of firms in the racial composition of their subsequent hires. We can do a, a similar exercise looking at not new firms, but new establishments of existing firms. And here, instead of classifying firms by the racial composition of the founder, we can classify them by the racial composition of incumbent employees at these firms. And we see a very similar pattern. So in red here, we have firms where incumbent employees are primarily white. In blue here, we have firms where incumbent employees are primarily blue. We see big initial differences in the racial composition of early hires at these firms that dissipate as cumulative hires increase. Um, one other thing we can we can look at here is not just the composition of hires, but how are those hires treated once they actually end up in the firm? Um, I'm going to skip the details here, but broadly what we're interested in is among hires, are firms with white and non-white founders more likely to dismiss or fire outgroup hires? That kind of... Um, finding would be consistent with a lot of mechanisms we have in mind for co-racial hiring. For example, things like referral hiring. It's been shown in other contexts that referral hires are less likely to be fired uh, compared to non-referral hires. And here we see a very similar pattern looking at dismissal rates. So on the vertical axis here, rather than looking at the racial composition of hires, what we've measured here is what's the racial gap in dismissal rates between white and non-white hires at these firms? So in blue, uh, if I look at this dark blue line here, what this first dot is saying here is that for firms with non-white founders, among their first 50 hires or so, they're about 4% less likely to dismiss their non-white hires. In contrast, at firms with white founders, they're about 8% more likely to dismiss their non-white hires. Okay, so big racial differences in dismissal rates as a function of the race of the founder. And again, we see this same qualitative pattern where these gaps are uh, decreasing as cumulative hires increase. Okay. So just to summarize uh, what we found here, we see near convergence between firms uh, with white and non-white founders in the racial composition of their subsequent hires and more moderate convergence in the dismissal rates of their hires with cumulative hires. An important thing though to keep in mind here is that few firms actually reach this scale. Okay, so on the one hand, there's kind of an optimistic note that over time these firms converge in what they're doing. 
yet few firms are actually going to reach that level. Our findings have some implications for, um, for other kind of policy questions. So if we think about rationales from affirmative action, this kind of finding provides potentially a new or a novel rationale for that sort of intervention. Because what we're seeing here is as firms mature, their racial composition of hires is going to slowly evolve to something that looks closer to the composition of the external labor market. And so an affirmative action policy, rather than you know, really distorting the composition of a firm's employees in the long run, in this case, it seems to be kind of pushing these firms along an existing trajectory and potentially speeding up this convergence process. These findings also suggest that it's, it's important to think about racial differences in entrepreneurship rates and their implications for broader labor market inequality. Um, it also suggests a link between resource allocations that affect the size distribution of firms and racial inequality. So if we have policies in, in place that make it hard for small productive firms to actually reach their efficient scale, this also potentially has implications for uh, racial inequality in the sense that that might also prevent firms from reaching a scale where they're going to have a more racially diverse workforce. One last note here is we're working on a, a similar kind of project here in the U.S. where we have good reason to think we'll find, find similar patterns. So just to, to conclude here, um, you know, I think this whole kind of strand of work is still in its early stages. There's a lot more to learn, but from what we've seen, there's a lot of evidence uh, emphasizing this malleability of the, for the demographic composition of firms' employees. One kind of open question is, what are the macro implications for these firm-level dynamics? So I think this is an important area for us to think more about, both with modeling and, and with data. You know, one kind of comment here is that it's important to note that firm-level progress is going to erode in the aggregate with firm-level turnover. So even if we see individual firms making progress, eventually those firms exit and that might mean that in the aggregate, things don't change much at all. Another thing um, that this work has really kind of made me passionate about is we need more granular data on how firms are going about making recruiting and screening decisions. Uh, here, you know, we can kind of inf try and infer what firms are doing from this more, of course, data on the hiring decisions that firms are making, but it's hard to kind of match that with more qualitative evidence on what practices firms are applying. The last note uh, here is that in both projects, I've emphasized implications for, in one project, studying affirmative action directly, in this project, thinking about the implications for affirmative action policies. I think it's important to keep in mind that the mechanisms and economic cases for affirmative action in employment versus higher education are actually quite different. And there's a lot of reason to think that these interventions within the labor market um, you know, actually are going to overcome important kind of economic frictions that are not necessarily present uh, in the higher education context. So these are just very different uh, uh, contexts and we need to, need to keep that in mind when we're thinking about policy um, uh, in the future. I will stop there and see if there are any uh, questions. Thank you. Well, thank you, Conrad. Super interesting. And yes, there are a ton of questions um, and I'm gonna get to as many as I can here. Um, and I'm gonna take the liberty of <laughs> the first question because you had a slide that said something really striking um, in the, about the persistent effects of temporary affirmative action. And the slide said something like the, the fixed costs of implementing these new screening and recruitment procedures could be irreversible irreversible, or they could turn out to be more productive for the firm than they expected. And, and thinking about like which of those two it could be, and prison might also be some mix, seems really important for thinking about the welfare implications, right, of, of doing this. You could imagine the skeptic saying, well, is this, you know, the fact that the firms, you know, adopted these really sticky and hard to change, you know, institutions and then stick with them, that doesn't necessarily mean it was a good thing. And you cited um, this paper by Amalia Miller and Carmen Siegel on affirmative action in police departments. They have another paper that I know you know about on um, looking at the effects of affirmative action of um, designed to hire women into police departments. And they look, 
you know, they do a two-stage thing there where they look not only at the effect of the, of the affirmative action um, regulation on hiring of more female police officers, but also the effect on things like reporting of domestic violence and incidents of violence against women, finding reporting goes up and incidents goes down, suggesting that it was a good thing <laughs> to hire more female. And so I'm wondering, my, my long-winded question is, is there, is there, have you thought about using the data that you have or, or new data to, to look at the kind of, you know, second stage impacts on these firms of hiring um, on, on whether it's, I don't know, whether it's stock market or it's earnings or it's just persistence, like some measure to show that, to, to combat the skeptical argument that, you know, maybe these things acted as a drag on firm performance. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a great question that I think, uh, I've been struggling with how to study for for quite a, a bit now. One one point I'll just make here is when I say irreversible fixed costs, there's the version of that I have in mind is not necessarily you know there's some sticky policy in place that's hard to remove. It's that you know you made some change. Um, so going back to this, you know, what schools do I recruit from? Example, it was costly to figure out how to recruit from a broader set of schools. Once we paid those costs, we now have this knowledge, we have these working relationships with schools that we can continue to use. And there's no way in which we can kind of sell that relationship back to some other firm or sell that knowledge back. So it's irreversible in the sense that we've paid those sunk costs, we may as well kind of keep using that investment. There's another version of this, which is more of a kind of institutional sticky um, stickiness where you know you maybe you, you put some policy in place in response to this regulation, and it's hard to remove that for whatever reason. Um, and you're right that you know one way you might try and tease those apart is you look directly what are some some effects on on productivity. Uh, that I think is a is a great kind of question to pursue. Uh, the challenge is for that particular research design. Um, if you try to graft on productivity data for that kind of project, the variation that's being used there is also related to something that also has implications for productivity and revenue measures. And that's whether I'm doing business with the federal government. Mm -hmm. So you want some other kind of natural experiment where your variation is, is your, your composition is changing for reasons that don't have to do with um, government contracting. Um, and that's been challenging to come by. But I, I think it's I think it's a it's a great question. I mean, one one thing that you can look at in those data that doesn't require any additional productivity measures is just whether these firms end up exiting um, the market, and that that does not seem to be related to to racial composition. Yeah, no, that's great that you, that you can show that. All right, so here's here's the the beauty of of having a a broad, a diverse audience. Is we have a question from. Um, an individual who worked for OFCCP <laughs> for six years and has a question for you um, about whether you were able to access the um, occupational codes of the of individuals who are getting hired into these firms to see whether there is any effect on economic mobility for individuals being hired as employees. Are they changing their um, occupational codes over time within the firms? Yeah, so one one challenge with that study is the EEO one data provide great information at the establishment level and the composition of their employees, but it doesn't tell you much about individual workers. So you know, for given occupation at the firm, X percent of managers at this firm are black or X percent are are Latino, um, but it doesn't tell you you know where those managers came from, what they were doing previously. So it's hard to know. Um, it's hard to answer that question because of that data limitation, although I think it's it's an, it's an important one. Gotcha. So here's a question about um, uh, other work that has suggested that the um, federal contracting effects that you're observing um, don't persist or maybe don't persist over time maybe after the 1980s. And I don't know whether that's because there's a different kind of enforcement regime in place, but have you thought about the whether... Um, there's still the same kind of, or I guess if you thought about estimating, has anybody looked at estimating the impacts of, of varying enforcement um, of, of, the, of the regulation? Yeah, that, that has been studied uh, in the literature. So I think one important thing to keep in mind with, with my study is it's actually focused on a somewhat narrow set of establishments, these establishments that are just contracting for a temporary period. 
in numbers, there's there's quite a bit of them, but they they don't actually necessarily account for you know that largest set of all federal contract work. Uh, and so, and you when you look at that subsample of establishments, you actually see quite a bit of responsiveness, even in this post 1980 period where people have thought enforcement has been super weak. Um, it's possible that in the period after my study that you know things are are there's kind of less response to becoming a contractor that I, I can't really speak to. But over my period of study, you actually see quite a bit of 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 response. But I think it's quite possible that even though I see that in my subsample, you know, if you looked at these big contractors, they might be more responsive to changes in the degree of enforcement because they might have better insights into, you know, to what extent enforcement actually matters um, for what they do. Yep. Yep. So we have a bunch of questions here, which, which might be a little bit unfair to ask you, but it's clear it's a, it's a, it's a very prominent issue of concern for, for people listening in, which is um, essentially the constitutional status of this particular executive order and its, um, its potential duration. And so you mentioned, you know, that these are very distinct, and I don't know if this is something, there was a subtext here to that comment at the end, these are very distinct settings um, for higher education and employment. Um, but have you thought at all about the, the potential um, longevity of, of this particular regulation given the current uh, constitutional context? Yeah, you know, I, I, that is that is now that I, I think now that I think about it, that is part of the subtext for why that comment. It's something I, I get asked about a lot, and I and I think, I think, you know, I think there are important policy questions in both contexts. But I've I've realized the more and more I think about it that the mechanisms are are probably quite different. I actually don't really have a sense for, you know, how broad. I, I don't know anything about the legal specifics of of how broad any ruling would be and how would it would affect affirmative action and employment. I'm surprised actually by how little I've read about that compared to the implications for higher education. Um, I mean, I think it, it's not super clear, given current enforcement, that while in pra- in principle, in, in affirmative action policy can have large effects on on firm behavior, as I've as I've shown. You know, it's not it's not clear. I think from existing data in the aggregate how important that is now. Um, so you know, it might be that it's a relatively small. Uh, it's playing a relatively small role now, and if we removed it, uh, it wouldn't be a huge. Uh, we wouldn't see it in the aggregate. I'm not. I'm not quite sure. Um, and I yeah, I don't really have any thoughts on what to do after that. <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah. 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 Um, and so maybe this this might be the, the last question here on the um, yeah it's such an optimistic picture um, the the Brazil paper right of the convergence um, uh, uh, irrespective of the race of of a, of a founder um, a convergence in hiring practices and I'm wondering I, I happen to be reading this book about Y Combinator um, you know and and, and and it was and it's very it was very very um, network dependent and in that particular case very gender dependent in terms of who would become founders and who would they hire and so it very much matches your story but I'm wondering we're getting some questions here about the settings in which you don't think you'd see convergence maybe because the um, the labor supply pools aren't aren't racially or or gender diverse and I'm wondering if you've given some thought about the the limits to, to where the story would work. Yeah, I think it's 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 a very important question and something we're hoping to dig into when we when we uh, work on the same question in the U.S. Uh, in Brazil, when you look across different industries, at least broadly, it's not clear this is more important in some industries than others. One important thing to keep in mind here is that this is convergence between firms with white and non-white founders. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're converging to a point where, say, half of the workforce is white versus non-white. They could be converging to something that reflects the fact that there's, in some particular sector, just few people from some group working in that sector. So they might both be converging to some point that's relatively low or lower than we want. Um, And that might be true when we think about, you know, tech as well, uh, that even if we had a diverse set of founders, you know, it's possible that even if we saw the same convergence pattern, they'd be converging to some composition that we'd still uh, be um wanting to push on. Yeah. 
Conrad, it's been so great to have you here. We have a ton more questions that we're not able to get to. We'll send them to you um, so you can see them. I want to thank you and thank everybody else for attending today. Um, and I hope that everybody tunes in to our next Centennial Lecture in April. Thank you. Thank you all for the great questions. Great. Okay. Bye, everybody.